Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Today on Misquoting Jesus, we're going to be talking about whether the God seen in Revelation is the same as the God in the rest of the New Testament. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the claim that the God of the Old Testament is somehow different to that of the New Testament, not necessarily a different God, but definitely a different portrayal. And as you may have realized over the past couple of episodes, a case can be made for the God of Revelation having more in common with that of the Old Testament than the rest of the New Testament. How do all of these depictions of God work together, and are they as contradictory as they first appear? Uh, but Bart, before we solve one of the great theological problems of our age, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing fine, thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny how the uh, you know the great problems of our age don't really um, kind of um, relate to our daily lives as much. Age, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the tricks, you know, teaching the um, teaching undergraduates is to uh, get them to start thinking about bigger issues. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so in my, I, you know, I think about this a lot when I'm going into the kids, you know, there's these big issues in the world and, uh, it's, uh, it's, and in people's lives. And so, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm doing well because I'm teaching these undergraduates this semester and it's really, it's been really fun because these are people who are very open to it. And so I've been really enjoying the semester. So, uh, yeah. How, how are things on your end? Yeah, all good actually. Are you teaching that class? Weren't you going to be teaching? Not that yet. That's that's going to be later in the year. I think um, May or June. They've uh -huh. got me slated to teach. But yes, teaching okay. Sumerian, which will be lots of fun. I need to fun, relearn fun Sumerian because it's been a yeah. while. Well, you know, my students don't think much about uh, the big issues in the world until they're kind of introduced to them. But, you know, some, some of them do, obviously. But I bet none of them think about Sumerian. <laughs> Probably not. And you know what? That's. That's, I think, a reasonable stance to take for your life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're talking about God as seen in Revelation and the New Testament and whether they're the same or, or how, how they're different. I'm sure you have thoughts on this. Why, why is this something worth talking about? Um, I think it's one of those issues that people, uh, anyone interested in the Bible, uh, this is the fundamental issue, really. really. Is there a a fundamental issue is there a consistent portrayal of god um throughout throughout the bible and even within even within the new testament um and if so what you know what is what is god like you know one of the <laughs> one of the interesting things about uh a lot of religions not just christianity but it's kind of evident in christianity is that people um say one thing about god but mean something else and uh, my students think this all the time when I'm teaching my class. I'll teach a class, I'll give a lecture on Gnosticism, the the Christian Gnostic religions, and I'll talk about how they have this God at the top of the 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 very top God who's so so far beyond anything that we can't imagine what he is. We can't say anything about him, and and then they start telling stories about him. <laughs> And, it's, and, it's, and my students say, "Well, wait a second, you just said like he's unknowable, and you can't. And you so how can you know anything?" And I and I always say, "Yeah, but it's like when I was a, when I was an evangelical Christian, we used to say God is far bigger than anything we can imagine. He's far beyond anything we can comprehend, and these are his attributes." <laughs> you know, and so well, it's the same thing, and so. Um, so, but, you know, in the Bible, of course, God is portrayed <laughs> in lots of ways. And the issue is, is there, is there a consistency uh, among these views, uh, even just within the New Testament, but also especially between the Old Testament and the New? That's probably a, a good place to move on to the next question. Uh, like I said at the beginning, like you've alluded to, God is portrayed in a myriad ways in both books. And there does seem to be quite a distinct divide between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, Old Testament Yahweh is often spoken of in terms of wrath and vengeance. New Testament people often characterize more in terms of love and forgiveness. Generally speaking, do you find this to be a fair assessment or is this a result of people not really reading the Bible the whole way through? Um, I think it's overly simplistic because it's 
it's actually quite complicated. And part of the complication is, of course, that you don't have like one author of the Old Testament and one author of the New Testament. You've got <laughs> the in the in the Christian Old Testament, there are thirty nine books and lots of authors. Some of the books have more than one author, and some you know some are authored by. But but so you know, get a lot of authors, and in the New Testament, you got twenty seven books with lots of authors, and authors don't have the same views about things, including the the nature of God and, and who he is. And but it's simplistic to say, you know, that the Old Testament is God of wrath. That's a common view. Uh even my Christian students will sometimes say, and not just my Christian students, their parents. I mean, people say, uh, you know, God in the Old Testament is God of wrath, the God of the New Testament is God of love. But you know, the reality is that the uh, the God of love in the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> of the Old Testament. God God in the Old Testament um, I mean, even Jesus himself said that, you know, it points out that in the Old Testament, the principal main verses for Jesus were Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And Le- Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And God loves his people Israel, and he chooses his people Israel, and he does good things for his people Israel. And so God is definitely a God of love in the Old Testament. Um He's also God of justice and uh, and of wrath. I mean, he's a God of wrath. He, there are some very troubling uh, parts of the Hebrew Bible where the God of Israel, in order to, to favor Israel, uh, inflicts horrible suffering and death on others. Um, sometimes to a uh, to a rather uh, to a, well to to a big extreme. I mean, everybody's familiar with the. Um, you know, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, <laughs> where, the, you know, they're going to conquer the promised land. And the promise, the problem is there are people already living in the promised land. Well, how are you going to take it? If there's, how are you going to live there? Well, you got to, you got to wipe out the people who are there already. And so they're instructed to take this town, the city Jericho, march around the city once a day for six days on the seventh day of march around seven times. And then, you know, shout and blow the trumpets and the walls will come a tumbling down. Down, uh, as we used to sing in Sunday school, and uh, and the uh, and the walls come a tumbling down, and they're told to go in there and slaughter every man, woman, and child and animal in the city. Children, yeah, this is God's command: slaughter the children. What? And you know there are actually passages that are worse than this in the in the Hebrew Bible, but from the point of view of the author, as from my point of view of my Sunday school teacher who taught us, you know, that saying on the battle of Jericho, uh, it's a good thing because this shows that God is powerful and, you know, God's in favor of his people. But you think about it on the other side, you're some, you know, person in Jericho, you know, you, your wife and three kids and you're sitting there and all of a sudden here come the troops and slaughter all of you. I mean, really? Uh, so, so there is, there definitely is wrath and violence uh, in the Old Testament that is commanded by God and that is inflicted by God. Uh, but he's also a God of love. And so it's not a simple picture. Thank you very much. That's a, a really helpful nuance, I think, um, moving forward. So we've had two episodes now on Revelation. And I think one of the overriding themes from both of those is the violence that we see in the book. How much of that violence is directly attributed to God? And do we see anything similar in the rest of the New Testament, um, yeah. So this is this is the other side of this kind of simplistic thing that you know the New Testament is the God of love, because when you read the Book of Revelation, uh, you'd be hard pressed to say that it's a God of love. People do say that, but when you actually read the book or read the words of the book, uh, the love of God is never mentioned in the Book of Revelation. The word love is never assigned to God in the Book of Revelation. Um, he's not said to love anybody. Um, he certainly uh, he certainly is said to be wrathful, <laughs> and he certainly inflicts damage. And so, how much of this damage comes from God? Well, um, I think all of it. Um, so, the way it starts, as we've seen in our earlier episodes, is that when the prophet goes up to heaven, he sees God sitting on a throne with this book with seven seals on it, and as Christ breaks the seals disasters start hitting the earth one after the other boom 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 and uh and horrible horrible suffering but the seventh seal leads to the uh the blowing of seven trumpets by seven angels which lead to seven disasters boom 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 when the seventh one trumpet blows that contains 
the seven, the the next set of seven are the bowls of God's wrath. God's wrath they get poured out on the earth. These, um, all of this is tied up in the seven seals because the seven trumpets are part of the seventh seal, and the seven bowls of wrath are part of the seventh trumpet. So it's all from the wrath of God, and this last one are called the bowls of God's wrath, and. And the deal with the deal with this seven 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 thing is that the, it gets worse and worse, <laughs> as you can imagine. But the first one kill it wipes out like a fourth of the earth, and then a fourth of the seas turn to blood. And so the next the next set the trumpets are a third of the, what's left, and the third of this. By the time you get to the bowls of wrath, it's like everything, and this is all it's all from God. Um, and so Christ is authorized by God, but it's God's plan. It's it's His scroll. He wrote the scroll. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's the wrath of God. So you mentioned that um, God's love is not mentioned anywhere in Revelation. Does uh, the language choice from John of Patmos um, line up at all with the language that we see used to describe God in the rest of the New Testament? Obviously, there's there's no love, but do the words he chooses to use are they completely new and different or are they still used elsewhere, just maybe in, in different um, quantities? So I'd say different quantities mainly. I mean, in terms of the term wrath, for example, um, there are several terms for wrath, but one of the common ones is orge. And orge is a common word uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, and um, it's, it's attributed to Jesus. Um, the ancient... Um, People who did ancient ethics, like ancient moral philosophers, thought some of them, like going back to Aristotle, would say that uh, uh, orge, that kind of wrath, in itself is not good or bad. Um, orge, sometimes it's justified, um, and sometimes it's not justified. And the problem is, you know, when you take it to an extreme, you're not being ethical. And if you don't exercise it at all when you should be, it's not ethical for, for Aristotle. And so or, wrath itself isn't a problem. The problem is how it gets manifested. And so when Jesus says, is said to get angry, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, it's always portrayed as a righteous indignation because people uh, haven't really ex understood uh, that he has the power to do what he wants to do, and he gets gets upset about it. But he doesn't throw them into lakes of burning sulfur. <laughs> and so, uh, so there are, uh, you know, so there's, there's wrath and there's wrath. The the um, interesting thing about the terminology is that John of Patmos, traditionally, as we're going to be seeing in the next episode, is traditionally thought to have been the author of the Gospel of John. And so you've got the Gospel of John uh, allegedly written by uh, by John, and then you get the um, you get the Book of Revelation allegedly written by John, and people say it's the same John. Uh, and if you just look at the terms like love and wrath, they certainly have very very different views of love and wrath. In um, in the right the other writings allegedly by John, like the Gospel of John, First John, God is love. And uh, Christ's command to his followers is to love one another. Love is a prominent word. It's a dominant word in the Gospel of John and in 1 John. And it's, um, you know, God doesn't love anybody in Revelation. And so I think, um, you know, he may be, maybe he's feeling love, but he's, not, he's, he's never said to feel it. And he's never, never shown loving. And of course, he does give his, he gives his own people uh, the city of, the new the new Jerusalem, and so people say, well, that's an act of love, and it may be, but it doesn't say that it's an act of love. What it says is that he's giving it to his slaves. They're called slaves, and so those who are enslaved to God are rewarded, but it doesn't say that it's out of out of love, and it's so different from other books of the New Testament, I think. So, what do we see of the wrath of God in the rest of the New Testament? So I didn't, you know, I don't want to say that God's not wrathful elsewhere or that there's not judgment elsewhere or because there is. Um, it absolutely is. It's fundamental to the teachings of Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus was urging people to repent of their sins because there was a destruction that was coming soon. And to enter into God's kingdom, they needed to turn back to God and behave um, Jesus in the Gospels never talks about eternal torment. He doesn't talk about what we would think of as hell, as a place to 
uh, where people will be tormented forever. As we, we talked about in an earlier episode, some English translations will translate one of the words Jesus uses as hell, but he doesn't mean what we're thinking of as this place of eternal torment, as can be easily shown, actually, and has been shown many times. But Jesus did believe that God was going to be, bring destruction to those who oppose him. But for Jesus, the destruction is, it's going to be like, this, there's going to be, they're going to be destroyed wiped out. They're not going to be tortured or thrown into burning lake. They're, 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 going, to be, they're going to be destroyed. And um, that will be the wrath of God. The Apostle Paul talks about the wrath of God that is already being manifest on the world um, because of disobedience. So the New Testament, uh, just to be clear, the New Testament absolutely does believe in the wrath of God and does believe that God will judge people. Um, but it doesn't go on about him torturing people and um, and you know, in, in in Revelation, Christ is said to hate people, <laughs> hate hate people. <laughs> what? So yeah, uh, it's not the, it's not the view of the rest of the New Testament. I think. Okay, so Jesus is clearly expecting in in the Gospels some kind of judgment from God um, for those who deserve it, and some kind of punishment, not eternal torment, but destruction. Does um, does the demographic of those being judged in Revelation match up with the people that Jesus was expecting to be judged and judged uh, negatively? Now, this is a really good question because it is so on tra- on track, and people don't people never notice it. Uh, so far as I can tell, I don't notice it. Nobody I talk to talk, talks to notices this in um, in the teachings of Jesus in say Matthew, Mark, and Luke, our earliest gospels. It is quite clear that the people who are going to enter into God's kingdom and will be saved uh, will be delivered from the destruction that's coming. The people who will be saved will be are the people who uh, enact God's will here on earth by uh, by loving their neighbors themselves and helping those in need. Um, that. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they know about Jesus or believe in Jesus. It's it's helping those who are in need. That's what God wants people to do. And so, you know, the Good Samaritan, for example, um, who helps, he's the one who is doing what God commands. The, the, the enemy of the Jew, not, not the Jewish leaders in this parable in Luke 16. Or in, in Matthew chapter 25, when the, uh, the judge of the earth judges everyone, he has them gathered into groups, sheep and goats. The goats are sent into, uh, into uh, to their destruction and the sheep are brought into God's blessed kingdom. And uh, it's not because they follow Jesus. Uh, they, they don't even know who this judge of the earth is. They've never even seen him before. And they say, well, what? You know, I've never, because he says, you know, you did these things to me or you didn't do them to me. You, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was lonely. You visited me or you didn't. And if you did enter the kingdom, if you didn't, you're destroyed. And they say, well, we never even saw you before. In as much as you've done it to the least of these others, you've done it to me. Doing good for others, helping others is what brings you into the kingdom in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the gospel, uh, in the book of Revelation, it has nothing to do with it. Um, And the striking thing in Revelation is even being a follower of Jesus doesn't do it. A lot of Christians, maybe even most Christians, don't make it in in the book of Revelation. Only those who agree with John the, of Patmos' view of things get in. At the beginning of the book, as we saw earlier, there are seven letters that Christ dictates to the churches of Asia Minor that he's writing to, and most of them are just filled with problems, and they're going to be cast out. <laughs> and so the only ones who survive the lake of fire are certain kinds of, certain kinds of Christians. Everyone else. It doesn't matter how you live your life. You've got to. You've got to have the right, right, right commitment to Christ. And it seems like this is the the overriding view of salvation and damnation that has been carried forward into a lot of, especially evangelical circles. It's less that you do right by others, and more that you believe in the exact way that I think you should believe. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you compare what Jesus says with what um, you you would hear in conservative evangelical preaching today, and Jesus Jesus tells people that the way 
you know, you, he, when somebody says, what do I have to do for eternal life? He says, well, keep the commandments, you know, don't, don't commit adultery and, and don't, don't commit murder and don't, you know, he lists a few of the don'ts and, and love you, you know? And so, uh, that's how you get eternal life for Jesus, um, by doing what God wants. And in some places it's clear people who aren't even Jews, who don't even know these things, if they do the right things, they'll get into the kingdom. Um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, our earliest gospels, Jesus never goes around saying, uh, "Believe in me, believe in these doctrines." You know, but but he, but he does say, if somebody says, "Well, what do I really need to do?" He says, "Give away everything you have and give it to the poor." But you go to evangelical, not every evangelical church, but but many churches today, you go in, and the goal is to believe in Jesus and to get rich. Or to give in, you know, believe in Jesus, and that's all that matters. And you know, okay, you're you you've got this, that, and the other thing. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. He doesn't really care about that. He just wants you to believe. So, what? <laughs> which which Jesus are you reading about <laughs> exactly? <laughs> uh, you know, you're not the ones in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I tell tell you that. <laughs> so if we look then at, at um, the judgment enacted on on people in Revelation. Should that be described as judgment, or is it more accurate to view it as retribution? Uh, yeah. You know, um, <sighs> vengeance is a very big deal uh, in the book of book of Revelation. I think the term vengeance occurs something like 14 times. And um, the... Um, the, the ju- it's judgment in a sense... Um, but it's judgment in the sense of um, it's retributive uh, justice. It's not meant to make anybody reform or try to do better or, um, you know, or anything like that. It's, it's, it's really coming out. It's get, going for blood. These people have done, uh, these people have not done, have not believed in God and believed in Christ where they're supposed to. And so they're going to be thrown into uh, a lake of fire. Um, so it is, uh, it's retribution, and you can see this in all sorts of ways. It isn't just, I mean, it's God and it's Jesus who are manifesting wrath. Um, justice isn't really that big of a word in Revelation. Wrath is a very big word. And when Jesus, uh, in one of the, when one of the seals gets broken, um, the, there's a, um, when the fifth seal is broken early on in the narrative, uh, you're shown a scene where those who have been martyred uh, for their faith, the Christian martyrs are under an altar up in heaven, and um, they're pleading that that Christ will avenge their blood. And um, Jesus, instead of teaching them a law of retaliate, non-retaliation, instead of saying, "No, no, you, you know, you know, you were martyred, you're going to be rewarded now, but we don't retaliate against those who hurt us," instead of that, Jesus says, "Just wait a while, and uh, you're going to, you'll get, you'll get your due reward, which is that these people are going to be slaughtered like you were mar- martyred." Um, and so this is, it is, it's retribution. It isn't. Uh, it isn't like um, loving justice. It seems that this is not quite in line with what we see in the rest of the Old Testament, the very famous um, turn the other cheek statement by Jesus, don't seek vengeance on people. Is is that accurate? Do we see retribution and vengeance espoused elsewhere in the New Testament, or is this mostly a, a revelation concept? You find uh, some places um, that talk about it, but not not at all like this. Um, you get um, you get you get destruction scenes for disobey people who disobey. For example, in the Book of Acts, uh, you have this early situation where the Christians are forming uh, commu- communities together, where they're selling all of their properties and uh, all of their goods and contributing to the common fund. And they're all, so it's a kind of like a Christian commune situation. And two people, uh, a man named Ananias and his wife, uh, Sapphira, um, sell their land, but they lie about how much they got for it. <laughs> and, so they, and so they give the money, but they don't give it all to Peter, who's the head of the apostles. And uh, Peter basically curses them and they die. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, and so this is God's, you know, God punished them. Or in the book of First Corinthians, Paul talks about um, uh, a man who is uh, sleeping with his uh, stepmother. <laughs> and Paul thinks this is a bad idea. A Christian, a Christian guy 
in the church is sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul thinks this is a bad idea. And he urges them to uh, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, which is interpreted by most historical scholars as being a kind of a death curse. Um, but in that case, he's being handed over to Satan for destruction. He's not being handed over to God for destruction. <laughs> and so you you do get you you do get things. You don't get anything like <laughs> like Revelation, where people are tortured for five months and then live on, so that God can throw them later into a lake of burning sulfur. That that isn't at all like what you get portrayed of God elsewhere. Thank you. I have one last question before we move on to other things. A lot of Christians obviously have a vested interest in trying to align the character of God that we see in Revelation with what's in the rest of the New Testament, because like you can't have different gods. It has to be consistent across the board. How do you see this kind of lining up typically done? And have you ever found any of the arguments convincing? Uh, it's been a long debate for uh, since virtually since Christianity uh, began, how you reconcile all of these differences. The I would say that the biggest debates have been um, between have been over the Old Testament. Um, and some of them are very interesting debates. We, um, the, there was a, there, one of the leading teacher, Christian teachers of the second century was a man named Marcion who, um, who read, <laughs> read these books fairly honestly. He said, look, the God of the Old Testament is not, you know, not the God of Jesus. And he didn't mind saying there really are two gods. <laughs> there are the God of the Old Testament, the God of Jared, the God of Jericho, who destroy, has sends Joshua into Jericho, is not the God of Jesus. I mean, Jesus doesn't go out telling people to kill the children. Jesus let the little children come unto me, and um, and you know you're not supposed to destroy the enemy. You're supposed to turn the other cheek, and you're to love the enemy. And so he said, look, the Old Testament is written by a different God. The God of the Jews is not the God of Jesus, and so it ended up being this non-Jewish thing and he didn't he he didn't accept uh marcin accepted um something like our gospel of luke and he accepted about 10 of our letters of paul but he didn't have the rest so he didn't have the book of revelation when you get to people when you get um people rejecting um revelation it's interesting that historically in the ancient churches we'll talk about in the next episode in the ancient church the problem with revelation wasn't the violence so much as the fact that um it's kind of, it's kind of crassly materialistic <laughs> like you're going to get all this stuff at the giant end. golden like, city city and uh you know that isn't really uh you know that doesn't sound like the god who says give away everything it's not you're not told to give away everything it's not like a, it's not like an investment strategy right that if you give away now you get more later <laughs> that that is not god's strategy the point is that stuff doesn't matter <laughs> and so the idea of like is this this 1500 cubicle gold solid gold city like that doesn't that doesn't fit in the violence um historically has not been as big of a problem maybe because people weren't as sensitive to issues of violence as much as people have become in the 20th century i don't i don't know of course people love violence but people often have portrayed god as a violent god and i think a lot of time a lot starting in the 20th century the god of love has become more of a prominent thing and so the violence has become an issue uh and so people who do try to reconcile the book of revelation with the portrayals of god uh elsewhere do point out that that jesus talks about a destruction that's coming and he likens it to weeds they'll be burned in a furnace and so that's kind of like people being thrown into a lake of fire, I guess, <laughs> except it's weeds. <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, uh, and that, um, you know, that God is portrayed as a God of justice and uh, throughout the entire Bible, including the New Testament. And here's how his justice is manifest, um, that, um, that he's going to destroy all the forces of evil and everything that sides with them. That is true for most of the uh, New Testament. Paul talks about the coming destruction. Um, there is a destruction that's coming. Um, and as in the book of Revelation, the other authors of the New Testament say it's going to happen soon. Paul tells people they need to watch out for it because it can happen any time now. Um, and so uh, all of that is consistent. I think the main inconsistency is the reveling in the violence that you get in Revelation, um, where 
he seems to be pleased about Jezebel being thrown onto a bed to have sex with other men and then Christ kill her babies. He seems to be pleased with that. Uh, and there's no, he has no problem at all with, you know, a third of the earth being, you know, destroyed uh, or, you know, or any of the horrible disasters that he did. There's no disturbance about it. It's just, you know, it's the way it is because this is what God wants. If God wants it, then it's got to be okay. And I think that's how people tend to look at it, that if God's going to do it, then we have no reason to question his ethics. Who are we? We're we're just we're just mortals. How can we possibly question the ethics of God? I think, and you know, if God decides to do something, by definition, it's right. The and I I get that. I used to hold that view. I used to think that you know I am not. When I was a Christian, I would say, look, I'm not. You know, it's it seems a bit extreme, but you know, God is God, and I have no right to judge judge what He does because he's all-knowing and I'm not. He's all-powerful, I'm not. But the irony is, I don't say that anymore, but the irony is the people who do say that, that God, we can't judge God's morals. The same people say, number one, that we in life are to imitate God. Well, if God, the way God acts is to torture his enemies, and we're going to be godly, and God, doesn't that mean that we have to, you know, we have to go after the enemies and kill them and first and torture them first? So that's one problem. The other problem is that people who say that tend to think there, there's this argument. One of the main arguments in evangelical circles today, not just evangelical, in a lot of Christian circles, is that because the reason people throughout the world have similar ethical codes. The reason we have similar views of morality is because as human beings, we've been given this sense by God. We have the morality that God has given us. In other words, God has instilled part of his values, his ethical values in us, which is why we have such wide agreement about ethics. Well, um, if you're saying that God has given us his ethical values, then how can you say that we can't compare our ethical values with God's? <laughs> we, these are the That's ones we thing. have. It's the same so, so that means that God, so, so it doesn't make sense that you can say, well, that's, you know, we're ethical like God and they, yeah, we're not ethical like God. <laughs> and so um, anyway, so I, I, I don't really think there's a good explanation for it, but if it's in your Bible, you know, for those of listening who it's in the Bible, they do need to figure it out. You know, how in a way that's satisfying to them, you know, how you can have a book like this in your Bible and it's still considered scripture. And just how, how do you reconcile it in, in your mind? Um, and people do. People do. And, I, you know, you have to if you're going to accept it as scripture, I think. Well, thank you very much for that and for all of the information that we've had today. That was fascinating, as always. Um, after the break, we will be back with Bart's weekly update and some audience questions. If you're enjoying the Misquoting Jesus podcast, you'd probably like my online courses as well. I've produced a number so far with multi-lecture courses on the New Testament Gospels and the books of the Pentateuch, standalone lectures on the Christmas story and the earliest Christian views of Jesus and a six-hour debate on whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead. If you're interested, check them out at bartherman.com. You'll receive a discount on your purchase simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. Welcome back. Now we have Bart's weekly update. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. Bart, what do you have for us this week? Well, you know, when, uh, when a university professor starts a semester, one of the first things they look for is what are, what are the dates of spring break? <laughs> Students so, too. Students <laughs> too. For some reason, fall break is like two days. Like they give you Thursday and Friday off, which is no good if you teach Mondays and Wednesdays, for example. It's like, but but they give you, you know, they give you a week off for uh for spring break. 
And, uh, you know, kids do whatever they do, and uh, but so do faculty. So uh, this year, we I've been thinking about our spring break. I'm going to be go up at our, uh, up here at the Mountain House, and I've got, I'm going to have like almost 10 days. Uh, Sarah's going to be out of the country. I'm going to have, me and my dog are going to be up here. And the the problem is you always think, oh, that's going to be great. I'm going to have so much time to get my work done. You know, I'm going to like be able to read all day long and write. And then, and then, you know, other stuff comes up. You end up not being able to do what you want to do. But it's a great thing to look forward to. <laughs> it's like, like a lot of things, you know, you have a, some kind of, you know, Christmas or something coming up, Thanksgiving, and you're kind of thinking about it. And then like, it's kind of an anticlimax when it comes, but still, it's something to work, look forward to. It's nice to think about and to plan for. Yeah, right. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoy that. Uh, and I, I do hope you get some work done. Um, Thanks. But uh, now we have our audience questions. Now it's time for Questions from Listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. Okay, so no outsmart Bart this week. This is just people Good. want to know your opinion on things. Yeah. Uh, so first question, the persecution of Christians and De Niro you've talked about previously and seems to depict it on a small scale, uh, limited to the city of Rome. How is this squared with the depiction of Nero and the Roman Empire in the book of Revelation? Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, in Revelation, Nero is seen uh, as, the, uh, as the enemy, uh, and Rome is the enemy of God, and Nero, Nero and Rome are they're kind of seen together. They're, they're kind of the same thing in some ways and for the book of Revelation. Um, they, uh, Rome and Nero are guilty for the blood of the martyrs, but that's only one of the reasons that they're a problem. A bigger problem for Rome, actually, uh, this is um, this is an interesting point. I guess we didn't get into this very much in our, in our discussions of Revelation, but it is kind of an important point, is that what this author is really upset about with Rome is not— Killing the martyrs is bad, is very, very bad, but it's not the main thing he talks about. What he talks about is how, how Rome has acquired all of this wealth on the back, backs of other people. And that Rome is uh, Rome is like the, this harlot that's out in the uh, wilderness, the the great uh, the whore of Babylon, <laughs> as she's called, and, mean, and he's meaning to use denig you know denigrating terms. Um, is the problem she's bedecked with all of these jewels? She has all of this wealth and this golden cup. And when you read about Babylon in chapter eighteen, they have all of this masses you have, of goods coming in the whole time, and you know, and pearls and cinnamon and trees and I mean, like uh, you know, wood and lumber and 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 uh, just marble. And they have all of this stuff, and they're fabulously rich. And this author hates that stuff. He he thinks that Rome has so corrupt that it has slept with the other nations of earth so as to become rich. Um, and that, uh, and that's why God is, God's going to destroy it. So, um, it, the, the persecution of the Christians in Rome under Nero was an important deal, of course, for these Christians. Although I'll say we don't have a, uh, a, um, a narrative of it, a descript narrative description of it by Christian authors. We have it from Tacitus, a Roman author, but it clearly was in Christians' minds. But Rome was had much bigger problems than just that. That is part. Of, that is that is a very important part of that. But you know, the problem is they've taken over the earth, and uh, God is to be the God of the earth. Christ is the Lord of all, not Nero. And so that's that's a major reason why Rome has to be destroyed by God is because all of the wealth that it's accumulated. Um, really belongs to the Christians because they're the followers of the king of the earth. And so they should have the wealth instead of the Romans. I see. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question. When did the idea of original sin become mainstream in Christian thought? Uh, the listener said that they heard it was invented by Augustine. Right. Um, it's difficult to talk about the the category of original sin because people um, mean different things by it. Uh, in theological circles, it has a very have a, has a very definite meaning, and the definite meaning it it has is one that was made most concrete and uh, most compelling and um, convincing by by Saint Augustine. So that that's right. Um, some people think that they find 
original sin already in the Garden of Eden narrative. Um, Adam sins, and uh, and then he has children. And they sin, and they have children, so it becomes universal. And that's kind of what Paul seems to be alluding to in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, um, Paul talks about how everybody sins because Adam sinned. Uh, and um, the idea then is that since we're all descendants of Adam, we sin. But Paul has actually something bigger than that in mind. For Paul, it's not just that we are sort of linear descendants. For Paul, when when Adam sinned, when he, he violated God's command, that allowed for a kind of demonic force to enter into the world. Paul talks about sin not just as an act of disobedience, but also as this power that's in the world that is trying to enslave people. For Paul, the reason this power of sin is in the world is because Adam sinned. But once it's in the world, it forces everybody to sin. And so you are enslaved to the power of sin, Paul says. And the only way to be liberated from the power of sin is through Christ. Uh, Christ liberates people from the power of sin, just as Adam put them under the power of sin. So for Paul, in that Paul has original sin in that sense, but it isn't what Augustine means. But it's but it's the sense that everybody, because of the original sin, everybody has everybody's in power by uh, over overcome by sin, the power of sin. Augustine, living centuries later in the early fifth century, develops his idea of original sin, which is uh, is not Paul's apocalyptic idea of an evil power in the world. It is that in fact there's something innate to human nature that compels them to do things that are contrary to the will of God, and in uh, in Augustine's view, that um, that part of the nature is passed on to you the way your body is passed on to you and your brain is passed on to you and you, your soul is passed on to you. It's passed on in the sex act. When your parents have sex, the man passes on the the sin nature through his semen, and um, and so uh, necessarily you have a propensity to sin because it's inside of you. So it's not an external force like for Paul, this cosmic power that's forcing you. It's, it's something that's built into you, and you can't do anything about it. And only by only through Christ can you be cleansed of this, of this sin. And that develops then into the question of why, you know, why Jesus was born uh, of a virgin. Um, she, she hadn't had sex, so he didn't get the sin nature. And then the question then is, well, how did— why didn't Mary pass on the sin nature she had if she's born born of Mary? And that's where the doctrine of, of the Immaculate Conception comes in. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is not about Jesus' virgin birth. It's about Mary being born. And it's not that Mary's mother was a virgin. Mary's mother, uh, um, Anna, in the tradition, her name is Anna, Anna uh, did have sex with her husband uh, to, to produce Mary, but God did a miracle. He made it so Mary did not inherit the sin nature uh, when, in, the, in, in the sex act of her parents. And so the immaculate conception is that Mary was born without a sin nature, so she couldn't pass it on to Jesus. So all of these doctrines are tied up to the, to the doctrine of original sin as Augustine formulated it, and it's not, um, it's, it's not in the New Testament that way. But of course, he's basing his views on his interpretation of the New Testament. That's fascinating. I had no idea there was so, A, that there were divergent thoughts on that and, and B, that they were so uh, complex and intricate. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, final question for today. If Jesus didn't believe in and preach an eternal hell of fire and torment, which as we've discussed, he did not, did such? how did such a, an unpleasant idea gain the level of acceptance that it did and so early on in church history? Well, this is a great question. Uh, and it's the question that I devote my entire book to, <laughs> heaven and hell. <laughs> That's the question of my book. Um, because I, I, I try to show in my book that the Old Testament does not have a concept of hell as a place of eternal torment. Jesus did not have a concept of hell as a place of eternal torment. Paul did not have a concept. And so where does it come from? Because <laughs> you just assume it's in the Bible, right? Um, it's, a, it's a long story. <laughs> it took me a book to describe. But... Uh, I can give you the simple answer to it, which is that um, <clears throat> Jesus and Paul were apocalyptic Jews who believed that the end was coming soon and that history 
the, the end of history is coming soon. History is divided into two kind of segments. You have the, the present age, which is controlled by the powers of good, uh, by, the, by the powers of evil. The present age is controlled by the powers of evil, and there's going to be a future age controlled by the, the powers of God. And so you've got this division. And so the way eternal life works for Paul and Jesus is that this age has gotten just as bad as it can get. I mean, look around. <laughs> Flooding, uh, droughts, starvation, epidemics, wars. I mean, it's <sighs> the thing is going apart. And Paul and Jesus both thought it's got in their day, they thought it's gotten as bad as it can get. And God's going to intervene and wipe out the forces of evil and bring in a new kingdom. This kingdom will be rewarded to those who are on God's side, the righteous. But this kingdom will come not just to those who happen to be alive when the end comes. That wouldn't be fair. So you just happen to be alive at that moment, so you get rewarded, but your great-grandfather, who is even more righteous than you, does not. That doesn't. That's not right. And so there was a doctrine within apocalyptic Judaism that when this end came, the judgment that came, the justice that came uh, for the righteous and the unrighteous would happen to everybody, even those who had died. Those who had died would be raised from the dead bodily to be brought into the kingdom or to be shown the error of their ways and destroyed. Uh, Jews uh, traditionally did not believe that there's a there's a way to separate your body and your soul. Uh, in Greek thinking, uh, going back before Plato, but Plato popularized this, you, when your body dies, your spirit lives on. You can't kill your spirit. It's going to live forever in Platonic thought and before and, and after. This became the Greek way of thinking about things, body and soul. Jews didn't understand it that way. In Jewish thinking, your spirit is more like what we would think of as your breath, kind of a combination of the stuff inside of your breath and your personality and your emotions. That's your spirit. But you have it as long as you have your breath. So in the Old Testament, when God creates Adam, he makes this dirt model that looks like it's humanoid, and then he breathes into it and it becomes alive. And, and Adam is alive as long as he's got the breath in him. When the breath goes, he's no longer alive. So the breath is what makes you alive. Well, when you stop breathing, where does your breath go? <laughs> your breath doesn't go anywhere. You just stop breathing. And that's where the, that's how Jewish thinkers thought it worked. You, you were alive as long, your body was alive as long as it had the breath in it. When the resurrection came, God breathed, lo, breathed life back into the body, so they come back alive. That was the view of Jesus and Paul. Um, so what ends up happening is this apocalyptic view in Christianity starts dying off after Paul. Because part of the view is that this all is going to happen pretty soon, like next Thursday, and it doesn't happen. And so people started thinking, yeah, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not the resurrection of the dead. And at the same time, most people converting to Christianity were not Jews. They were Gentiles. And if they had any education, it was a Greek education where they believed in the separation of the body and the soul. And so what ends up happening is that this evil age followed by the good age to come, this, this kind of dualism gets flipped on its axis. So it's now no, no longer a horizontal dualism. It's a kind of a vertical dualism. Instead of a temporal dualism, it's a spatial dualism where you get heaven and hell. And so it's still a dualism. Those will be rewarded, though, aren't brought back in their bodies. God forbid, I've got to live in this body the rest for eternity. No, no, you're going to be, your soul's going to live on and you're going to live on in heaven. So that start ha starts happening uh, toward the end of the first century and into the second century. By the end of the second century, it's the common view that um, that souls live on, and that's where you get heaven and hell from. And so the, the, what I try to argue in my book is that in a weird way, the standard Christian view of heaven and hell is a kind of a conflation or a combination of the views of Jesus and the views of Plato. Uh, a co combination that neither one of them had. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. Sorry, that was a long answer. It was a great answer, though. I'm sure everyone I could have, would be very I could have just said, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> you could, you could, but this is much more satisfying. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so before we finish then for the week, would you mind summarizing what we talked about today? Um, yeah, so um, we talked about uh, today how how God is being portrayed in the Bible generally, whether there's a consistent view of God, and in specifically in, with respect to the New Testament, whether the book of Revelation uh, stands out among the other books from having a different view. 
um, the Old Testament God is often called a God of wrath and the New Testament God a God of love. And I think that's far too simple. The God of the Old Testament is certainly a God of love as well. And the New Testament God is a God of wrath as well. And so it's too simple. But the God of wrath comes out with um, rather graphic explicitness in the book of Revelation, where God is basically a God of wrath. There's no love connected with God in the book of Revelation explicitly. Um and, and I think implicitly, he's, God is out for vengeance. And I think that that, that is an, a different understanding of God from what you get in the rest of the, rest of the New Testament and in the teachings of Jesus. I'll also say, though, that it's not that the rest of the New Testament has a view of God. Different authors have different perspectives. Uh, that's why you have 27 books instead of one book. But Revelation does stand out in this respect, that the violence and the wrath of God is uh, is unique within the New Testament writings. Thank you, Bart. Audience, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.barterman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we going to be talking about? Well, um, you know, one of the big questions people always ask me about uh, with respect to the book of Revelation is, why is that in the New Testament? (laughs) That's a good question. And so, uh, yeah, well, so we want to talk about, you know, how did it get in and was everybody in favor of it? And if not, why? (laughs) And so that's, that's what we'll be talking about. Wonderful. Please, everyone, join us then. Thank you all and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.